Coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. And this guy walks through the front door and I go, I know this guy. And he's all hunched over, greasy, long ponytail. And I go, that's freaking tiny, the gypsy joker that I had such issues with. And he shuffles to the, to the desk and he looks at me and he goes, you don't remember me. And I said, yes, I do. Later that day, he and I went out and fished Tenkara together. He, he became a big Tenkara fisherman. That's, that's what fly fishing does. It brings people together. That was Craig Matthews on one of his encounters with the Hells Angels. Caddis Hatches, Yvonne Chouinard, and his creation of 1% for the Planet. Today on The Swing. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how are you doing today? Thanks for stopping by the show. We just wrapped up the big Stillwater School giveaway yesterday, and we're going to be picking a winner very soon. But if you want to get involved in this, if you want to grab a slot right now, you can just do that by heading over to wetflyswing.com slash trips. Trips is what you need if you want to just grab. We're heading up to Northern Lights Lodge up in northern BC for some crazy stillwater fishing, uh, some epic wilderness uh, lodge experiences. This is an amazing trip. Heading up there with Skeet and the crew. Uh, so check it out right now. You can actually book a slot right now at wetflyswing.com slash trips. Today's episode is sponsored by Range Meal Bars. Each bar is 700 calories and fits easily into the pocket of your backpack, vest, or wherever you need. Range bars are made using only the highest quality gluten-free ingredients, and they are the most convenient and compact way to get out the door and on the river. You can support this podcast and a great local company right now by heading over to wetflyswing.com slash range. That's R-A-N-G-E. Range Meal Bars, a legitimate meal in your pocket. Today's episode is sponsored by Trestle, who you know from their game-changing telescopic fly rod roof rack systems. But did you also know that Trestle just released the only universal bike rack system designed exclusively for the angler and outdoorsman? You can check out this new universal rack system at wetflyswing.com slash Trestle right now to see their full line of gear-carrying products and the Artist Series apparel. That's Trestle, T-R-X-S-T-L-E. Trestle, live your pursuit. Craig Matthews is on the show today to share some amazing, crazy stories from his life around Yellowstone and as a police officer. We hear about how he created 1% for the planet with Patagonia founder Yvonne Chouinard. We get the full breakdown on fishing caddis flies and, uh, and their life histories of caddis. And we also find out a little bit more about this gypsy joker. This one will not disappoint I guarantee it. Here we go. Craig Matthews from Craig Matthews Yellowstone Conservation.com. How you doing, Craig? Doing well. Doing well, Dave. Good to be here. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for putting some time together today to uh, dig in here. You've got a lot going on. You've got a, a lot going on, on the conservation side. You got a lot going on in um, the fly fishing side. You've written some books. Um, I'm excited to dig into all this. Uh, kind of the challenge today was really focusing because you know, there's so many things we can dig into, you know, with you. But let's just take it back like we always do. Start off with fly fishing. How'd you first get into it? And then we'll go into some of the conservation stuff and everything else. Uh, it sounds great. I've been fly fishing for, I hate to say it, about 68 years. Um, started in Michigan where I grew up. We moved here uh, to Montana. We live in the Madison Valley, Madison River Valley in Montana, between pretty much halfway between Ennis, Montana and West Yellowstone, Montana where I used to be the police chief. And uh, we got here uh, again, I was a police chief for a few years and then we started our business, our fly fishing business in West Yellowstone back in 1979. So I've been, I've been at it for quite some time. Oh, wow. So what happened? So you're a police chief. What was that transition like uh, going from a police chief into, um, you know, into your business? Was that something you've been working on for a while to get prepared for? No, actually, that's quite a story in itself. Uh, long story short, I was a cop back in Michigan, and I was going to graduate school working on a couple of master's degrees. And we used to come to Yellowstone and fly fish. Uh, my wife and I, we take our overtime as comp time and spend as much as a month here in the fall fly fishing. And one day in the middle of the winter in, in February, about this time uh, the year, my wife said, uh, 
you know, let's move to Yellowstone for one year. And uh, she called on the phone. I thought she was kidding me. And they, they actually they hired her on the phone as a police dispatcher. And two days later, I was we were flying out to interview for a police position. They hired me as the police chief. Um, and the rest is kind of history. After a few years, and I was making a whopping $9,000 a year as the police chief. And West Yellowstone back at that time was totally wide open. It was a three-ring circus. Um, but anyway, uh, one day the fire chief said, what the heck are you doing? You're not going to be the police chief here forever for $9,000 a year. And I said, you know, the idea hit me to start a wholesale fly fishing, wholesale fly tying business um, and hire disabled fly tires. And eight hours later, they were digging the hole for, uh, for our business. We went up to the state capital, uh, Helena, Montana, and worked with the state people and, and brought back uh, six disabled handicapped individuals, taught them how to tie flies, and away we went into the uh, wholesale fly tying business. Wow. And that was uh, Blue Ribbon Flies? That was, and that was in 1979. And a couple years later, I retired as the police chief, and uh, we opened up retail. And we had at one, one time, we had four four fly shops. We had three in Montana and one in Mountain Home, Arkansas. Wow. So you had, yeah, you had multiple places all around. And was the selling of the flies, was that always a big part of the shop? It was. We had at one time 40-some, I think 43 or 44 fly tires. We even had federal prisoners tying flies for us. Uh, we tied for L.L. Bean and Orvis and, and a lot of the local fly shops as well as fly shops around the country. Um, but when I retired as the police chief in 1982, we decided when we opened up retail um, that we'd give the wholesale business to the fly tires, which we did, and then we went retail. Oh, wow. Okay. I don't want to miss the the federal prisoners because uh, that sounds like an interesting thing. What Talk about that because that sounds like that's um, there might be some challenges there just with like, you know, a business and federal prisoners. Well, but... there, there was, but we had one prisoner who was a fly tire. Um, before he was incarcerated for pulling a bank job. And uh, he decided to get a hold of us and see if we could use some flies. And we worked with the prison at that time to to uh, be allowed to send fly tying tools, which, of course, scissors and bodkins and that sort of thing, uh, would be considered as weapons. Anyway, we got that uh, taken care of. And then we even had uh, local prisoners um, tying flies for us, local guys that were in the jail I had one, Wes, I'll never forget. He tied muddlers. He could tie 40 dozen muddlers a week. And we furnished those muddlers at that time, the L.L. Bean. So it was really it was really a unique experience. And we had uh, a dozen fly tires working in Blue Ribbon Flies uh, 24-7. Um, we had shifts, uh, tie-in flies, and we'd have uh, everything from tractor, trailer, semi-truck drivers stopping by for coffee and watching the fly tires all night long to uh, tourists and, and fly fishermen. It was quite an experience. And, uh, you know, your customers become your best friends, and that's that's what it was all about. We made so many friends that way. Oh, wow. So how does that work with the, um, like, were you able to kind of get a profit off of that, or was that like a different sort of thing? Oh, yeah, yeah. What was unique is, for instance, if we pay them $10 a dozen, um, the, the prison actually would take $9 of that for their upkeep and give them a buck to buy cigarettes, buck a dozen. And so, you know, it was saving taxpayers money. Um, it was really, it was really, and you know, sometimes I wish we had uh, uh, really stuck with that. Um, but, it, you know, the business grew so fast. Um, it was kind of scary at that time. You know, the, the interest in fly fishing was really taking off. And of course, we I became a, a guide and outfitter in 1980 um, while I was still the police chief and running Blue Ribbon Flies. So it was quite a challenge, and we were burning the candle at both ends, providing guides and outfitters and tie-in flies. And then, of course, when we opened up retail, it was literally 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah, you're going strong. What was it like? So eventually, you uh, what happened? You sold the business or you retired? How that how'd that work? Well, we gave the wholesale fly tying business to the fly tires, and then we went with a retail business. We sold our business um, in 2014. Um, after basically 35, 36 years. And I still worked at the shop and we did some consulting. My wife and I, you know, my wife ran the business end of it. I was just kind of the face man, hmm. <laughs> the, the the Walmart greeter, if you will. <laughs> um, 
And we built a really strong business. Um, and then we got involved in so many conservation projects um, as a sideline. And that became a full-time uh, ordeal in itself. Right, right. And that's a perfect transition because I, I want to dig into everything on, the, you know, some of the books you've written and, you know, the kind of fly fishing and stuff. But I, I didn't want to miss the 1% for the planet, you know, and I want to hear the story there. So talk about that. Well, how you know, did, yeah, maybe start back with uh, Yvonne and, and how that whole thing came to be. I'll tell you how I met Yvonne because it was kind of a unique story in itself. I was uh, back about 1980, 1981. Um, I was alone in, in Blue Ribbon Flies. I was tying flies for an order and phone was ringing and I was talking on the phone. And uh, this this man walks in the door and Yvonne's pretty short in stature. And he walked up to the fly tying bench and I, I peered over and I just kind of said, I'll be right with you. And he's watching me tie flies and talk on the phone. And he patiently waited until I was done with the phone call. And he said to me, he said, I'll never forget. He said, this is kind of a cool story. He said, do you guys carry Patagonia? And I said, God, <laughs> I said, we'd love to carry Patagonia, but the then sales rep at that time wouldn't give it to us. And he stuck out his hand and he said, listen, he said, my name is Yvonne Chouinard. And he said, you have Patagonia because he said, this is a working fly shop. And I haven't seen anything like this in quite some time. And I want you to carry our, our line. And he and I became instant friends. Um, and again, that was, that was 40 years ago. And we've become buddies and fishing pals ever since. As a matter of fact, we're um, talking to you right now. This is what we call the Chenard room in our home. We have a little room where he and his wife stay when they come and visit with us. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. We've talked about him and Patagonia quite a bit. We've had some done some Patagonia episodes. And you obviously bet. they're they're leading the way with a lot of the conservation stuff. Um, take us back to the one percent for the planet. So you you uh, started that with him, right? Tell yeah, us that story. How'd that begin? He and I were were fishing, which we did a lot uh, together, and we still do. Um, we were fishing together one day, and we both knew we were involved quite heavily in conservation matters, but we never really sat and, and talked about it. Well, we took a break. It's something that we very seldom do when we're fishing together. And we're sitting on the bank of the river right in front of right in front of where I'm sitting right now, right down below our home, um, right on the Madison River where Horse Creek empties in. There's a little pasture there and we're taking a break and we're talking about conservation and some of the things we've done. And, and lo and behold, we both found that we were donating uh, a percent of our gross sale. And that's the key gross sale, not not propus hocus pocus, uh, grow sales to conservation. And at that time, um, we were donating, uh, it turned out to be 2.2%. And Yvonne and I decided at that time, because our businesses were dependent, you know, on a healthy environment, and we'd been giving back to a healthy environment, to conservation uh, programs and advocacy and ad activism programs, we decided that we would... Uh, Start a, start a little uh, venture called 1% for the Planet. And the following week, I flew down to Ventura and we put it all together. And the rest is, is basically, uh, we're chugging along. We recently broke uh, $435 million um, in conservation giving, which I'm something I'm very proud of. We celebrated our 20th anniversary last year in uh, L.A. and had quite an event there at the summit, the 1% Summit. Right. So it's still going strong in, in Patagonia. And I mean, it, that must have evolved over the years. But what does that look like being, I, and I'm trying to think back in 1980, Patagonia, they probably were going, but early on. What's that been like seeing the evolution of Patagonia into this kind of world leader in, in what they're doing? It's been really unique and it's been quite a wild ride. And I've been so, so fortunate to be part of it, Yvonne. You know, although I've never worked for Patagonia, I've worked a lot with Patagonia. Um, and of course, Yvonne has transitioned the, the corporation now into a conservation foundation. But it's been a lot of fun and it's been a lot of work. But we've we've met the greatest people. And uh, unfortunately, there's very few fly fishing businesses that are members of 1% for the planet. Um, why, we don't really know. But anyway, um, we have over 3,000, I think, members now worldwide and, you know, our mission, of course, is to accelerate smart uh, environmental giving. And uh, it's really been been fun to watch uh, the, the advocacy part of it and the activism part of it and watch it grow and how it can 
uh, positively have an impact um, on a healthy environment. Mm -hmm. And talk about that. How does it have a positive impact? Like, how are those decisions made about where the one percent goes as far as funding projects? Well, what's what's really unique about one percent for the planet? It's kind of like paying your income tax, but telling uh, those in power where you want your income tax money to go. In other words. When you contribute to 1%, you write your check out to those research and approved conservation causes. And that's how we've been able to make such a positive impact with uh, programs like our $3 bridge project. Um, we recently did a project with the BLM um, and a private landowner where we gained access to six miles of the Madison River for walk-in fly fishermen as well as hunters and bird watchers. We've done uh, big projects like the Olive Ranch easement, conservation easement with Trust for Public Lands. We work with the Nature Conservancy, all of that to uh, protect locally here in the Madison Valley. The valley is uh, over 55 percent protected by conservation easement. And much of that has been a result of one percent for the planet giving. Um, and again, you know, you write as a business owner, you write your check to those conservation causes and environmental causes. And in the state of Montana, which is, you know, we recently gained a million. We have, have finally recognized as having a million um, people occupy the state of Montana, a million residents. But 1% for the planet has given over $8 million to conservation causes in the state of Montana. So it's had a huge impact um, locally and a very positive impact on, on conservation projects. We, uh, for instance, the Odell Creek restoration project, um, a lot of people came at us because it's enhancing a private fishery. But where we came at it was it enhances uh, greatly a private fishery by stream restoration. But that stream has become is one of the biggest uh, tributary streams to the Madison River. And by recruitment of thousands and thousands, if not millions of wild trout, a lot of those end up in the Madison River. Um, you know, they just entrain down to the Madison. So it's a real public benefit at a small price um, to the uh, business owners who greatly benefit from that. Right. So essentially in a general sense, I mean, you would take, say, if somebody made a thousand or a hundred thousand dollars in a year, a company, they could give a thousand dollars, you know, that's the one percent or whatever. Right. And then, and then they literally write a check to say a specific group that they love. Yes. And that. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then, then it's tracked through, however, through your processes. That's correct. You know, you either uh, submit a certified uh, public accountant um, receipt that says that you're doing that and acknowledgement that you're doing that every year. Um, you have to be certified every year that you're a business that you're. And recently we started a individual membership where people like myself who are retired can actually be, uh, become and stay a member of 1% for the planet by donating 1% of their gross income per year. Gotcha. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, I love how open it is to, yeah, let people choose what groups they want to support, right? So what happens yeah. when you have a, per, you know, do you ever find that people maybe support groups that are, um, I mean, you know, there's a lot of politics, obviously, that gets into some of this in a kind of a negative way at times. Do you find that's ever an issue where there's groups that maybe one percent wouldn't really support or is that vetted through the process um it is vetted through the process you know it has to be a researched and approved by one percent for the planet headquarters conservation cause so if you know a lot of people donate to the uh, bozeman symphony that's fine and dandy but it's not a conservation cause so consequently they can't certify that perfect gosh this is great so, I mean, you must be, I mean, with that, and then you have a lot of other things going on still. What do you think when you look at the area? I mean, it sounds like you're really focused in, you know, where you're at on the Madison, Montana. Um, what do you think is the biggest challenge if, you know, just staying on that conservation to, um, you know what I mean, protecting these wild places? Yeah, probably the biggest, uh, the biggest cause that we're, we're really concerned with, of course, is wild trout habitat. Uh, preserving wild trout habitat, protecting it. Um, and that's where like our $3 bridge project came, came in so strongly, protecting about four miles of the river from harmful streamside development. You can imagine if there was homes every hundred yards in that whole uh, four mile stretch on both sides of the river, 
uh, two miles on both sides of the river. You can imagine, you know, not only lawns uh, extending right to the right to the water's edge, habitat destruction. Um, you know, that that's what that's what our goal is right now is habitat protection, primarily on the Madison River. Okay, perfect. Good. Well, let's let's maybe start there on the Madison because you know, I mean, there's a bunch of amazing, famous rivers in that area, but the Madison is definitely one of them. Um, and you've written some books. Maybe we can start there with your books. Give us a little rundown on what you've written over the years, and uh, and then we can start there. Well, myself and a very good friend of ours and former business partner, John Jurasek, the first couple of books we wrote were Fly Patterns of Yellowstone, Volume 1 and 2, um, back in the 80s and, and early 90s. And then we wrote a book, uh, 1992, called Fishing Yellowstone Hatchets, which takes an angler... Uh, through all the all the major insect emergences um, in and around Yellowstone country and the, actually around the Mountain West, um, mayflies, caddis, stoneflies, that sort of thing. And a lot of people are are really surprised to hear there's only about a dozen caddis species hmm. that are important to anglers. And uh, we try to make that very simple um, for anglers to understand. It's loaded with uh, color photos and and tips and technique. Yvonne and I uh, and Maro Mazzo from Italy just finished a book. Uh, it's going to go to press this summer um, on pheasant tail flies, tying flies strictly with pheasant tails. It's more of a booklet, a lot of color photos and a lot of our, our favorite patterns, and it simplifies a lot of that uh, through our simple patterns. Much like our book, uh, Simple Fly Fishing, which uh, we wrote several years ago, and it was just revised a couple of years ago. And that that volume that book is sold over uh, thirty thousand copies, which is pretty big for a fly fishing book. And what I'm really uh, proud of is the fact that proceeds from the sale of that book profits go to conservation, every penny of it. So that's really that's really fun too. Um, and I've written books, uh, Western Fly Fishing Strategy. I wrote back in the uh, mid 1990s. Um, that's probably the book I'm most proud of. I wrote the Yellowstone Fly Fishing Guide, that was, which was just revised three years ago. Um, that's gone through several printings. The Lions Press um, published that. And Nick Lyons, of course, is a real good friend of ours. Oh, nice. Nice. We had Nick on a while back. I'll put a link in the show notes. That was a great episode here in this yeah. store as well. He, he, and I keep, he and I still keep in close touch. He's in Florida right now. Oh, he's in Florida. So here's a question for you that, that really hit me with him is that, I mean, just the amount of work that guy put in, right? It sounded like he didn't even sleep. I mean, are you similar to him in like in your life? Is that kind of how you were just kind of go, go, go? Yeah, kind of four hours of sleep. can you know, I, I guess I, I've always been like that. My my dad was like that. He'd get up every morning at four o'clock in the morning, he owned a ch little chain of drugstores and gift shops, and he'd go, go, go. And uh Unfortunately, he didn't have any hobbies other than his customers. His customers were his hobbies, and he enjoyed it. I got my fishing and hunting hobbies from my, my grandparents and my uncles. But nonetheless, you know, I'm the same way. I get up very early in the morning and and get to work. Oh, you do? You So you still tie flies? I still tie about 1,000 dozen flies a year, about 12,000 flies a year. Um, wow. And I donate a lot of those to conservation causes. And that's been a lot of fun. Our, our bird skins that we harvest when we're bird hunting, um, I skin those and the sale of those goes to conservation causes such as the Yellowstone Cutthroat Program. My wife and I were on the board of the Yellowstone Park Foundation, which is now called Yellowstone Forever. We were on the founding board of that for, for nine years and really got involved with the fisheries programs and brought, uh, brought some great awareness um, through our customers to that program. And I was always proud how many of our customers uh, jumped on board and supported those programs in the park. Mm, wow. Yeah, so I think you answered that question. Yeah, you are probably similar to Nick. You just, uh, you're kind of go, go, go. You love, I mean, working probably doesn't <laughs> feel like work, right? It feels like it's just you enjoy it. It's it's something I look forward to every day. And, you know, I Nick and I spent so much time on the on the rivers together over the years, and unfortunately, he doesn't get out here as much anymore. He was out here a couple of years ago, and we're trying to get him out one more time and fish on Spring Creek. Uh, he and I spent a lot of time on on Spring Creek, which of course he wrote his iconic book Spring Creek, um, all about. And uh, 
it's one of my favorite fisheries and I know it is Nick's too. And we, we still talk about all the days that we shared on Spring Creek. Right. And and you mentioned the, um, the pheasant tail. So that book is interesting because Yvonne, right. I mean, that was one of his things he's been on talking about yeah. how he's been fishing like the pheasant tail right around all these species. Talk about that. How'd that book, did he come to you and say, Hey, we need to do something here. How'd that evolve? Well, he and I have always joked and, and Marl, you know, Marl's from Italy and Marl shows up every now and then. And, and the three of, three of us fish together, <laughs> I can tell you some stories. Uh, we could go on and on and on about that. But we sat one time, we talked about all the patterns that we tie using pheasant tail. Uh, you know, Yvonne with his little pheasant tail soft tackles, Marl with his pheasant tail nymphs and myself with a series of dry flies that I tie with pheasant tail for bodies. And we said, God, we've never written anything about that. And it's such an easy material to obtain and use and tie with, and it's simple. Let's tell our story about the patterns that we've come up with. Um, And just do a simple little booklet with a lot of color photos and step-by-step photos that show how we tie our flies. So there's, you know, there's about maybe 30 patterns max um, in the book, and it's with a little technique, and it's, uh, talk a little bit about technique, but how to utilize the pheasant tail fibers. A lot of people think, when pheasant tails, they think of nymphs, um, and rightfully so, but I, I love to use pheasant tails for dry flies, that frilly little fiber on each one of the fi- tail fibers, the center tail fibers, suck up fly floating like crazy. They float like a cork, they're durable, You know, a lot of people say, well, you got to rib them with wire. No, I just rib them with my tying thread. I just figure figure X through the pheasant tail material, and I tie things from midges all the way to big salmon flies using pheasant tail for the body. Nice. I mean, it is one of my favorites, too. I mean, there's so many different styles. Are uh, are there any Euro nymphs in that 30-fly selection? Yeah, and again, Maro is, is, and I don't want to let any cat out of the bag, until yeah. the little book that comes out, but Maro was in charge of all the little, little Euro nymphs. Um, I think he ties Euro nymphs, check nymphs, and variations thereof um, in the, in his little section. Gotcha. Okay, cool. So we got something to look forward to, and we'll. Uh, and do you know when that book's going to be uh, published? We're looking at sometime late uh, late this year or first part of 2024. I still think it's going to come out late this fall. Yeah, good. But we'll put a link in at a later point when we get that ready to roll. Um, One last thing about the yeah. book. Uh, it will come out, you know, fairly soon because I want, I want to say this. We ordered the paper the other day. So so we know it's going to be published uh, whenever, whenever it comes out. It'll be sometime either, again, late this year or first part of 2024. Drifthook has pre-packed fly assortments for every stage of your fly fishing journey. Their professionally curated fly fishing kits are crafted so you can catch more on your next outing. Each kit is organized by species and includes instructional videos and easy to follow guides. I've got the Nymph box right here in my pack and I've been loving this. They've got everything from the tiny zebra midges with a little flash or all the way up to their large go-to guide flies. This box has you covered for all conditions. And were you thinking Euro nymphs? They got that covered as well. Beautiful Euro nymph flies, all the key flies you need to get going, whether you're a brand new to it or a veteran, Drift Hook has the flies for you. Along with their nymph boxes, they have dry flies, streamers, and all the education to go along with all these as well. These are fly shop quality flies, hand tied and inspected before being carefully packed neatly into these boxes. And Matt personally packs and prepares these boxes like he was tucking the kids in for bed at night. Cozy, comfortable, and just the right amount of love. Whether you're an experienced angler who needs to stock up on some flies or get a great gift for the family, uh, Drift Hook has you covered. Check them out right now. That's Drift Hook, wetflyswing.com slash Drift Hook, and use swing at checkout to get 15% off your next order. You support this podcast and small business by checking out Drift Hook right now. Let's go around the block here on like, uh, you know, hatches and things like that, because, you know, there's a lot of famous rivers. We talked about the Madison, all the stuff in the Yellowstone, everything through there. 
Um, let's maybe dig into your book and talk about that. How do you describe that if somebody doesn't know a lot about what's going on, what flies to use? You know, just maybe describe your book a little bit and then how you share that to somebody who's new to like fishing dry flies. Sure. Um, you know, the Fishing Yellowstone Hatches book, as well as all our books, talk about the hatches and it takes you through this. They all take you through the season. It's really kind of a simplification of the insect emergences that, um, you know, you look at basically we have a chart and a graph on when insects emerge from, uh, you know, December through the following uh, November. We take you through the entire year and we, we try to organize um, what insect emergences you can expect on the rivers in Yellowstone country. And Yellowstone country comprises a big amount of real estate. But it, it takes you through the beginning uh, mayflies, for instance, the small betas, the, the blueing olives that begin emerging in March. Um, and then again, you know, they're multi-brooded, so they, they emerge a couple of times, if not three times a year. Same thing with caddis. You know, caddis, I think, puzzle anglers so doggone much. And we take you through uh, the dozen species of caddis that are very important to fish on Western rivers. And it's very simple if you know when to expect the emergences. In other words, if you're going to be here in July, you know Hydropsyche, the tan caddis, is going to be the force on the Madison, Yellowstone, Henry's Fork, those rivers. And you're prepared. And it also um, gives you the popular fly patterns, whether it's an X caddis or an iris caddis, um, to successfully fish that hatch. It, it describes the rise forms, how to detect the rise forms, um, you know, the three biggest clues to uh, recognizing a caddis emergence. Most people think that fish have got to be flying out of the water, um, much like prior uh, authors have described, for fish to be uh, feeding on caddis. But that's not necessarily true, depending on the currents and the, the, the volume, the number of insects emerging. You know, the hydropsyche hatch, the big one that comes off six weeks a year on every river in the West primarily, those fish will, will porpoise roll and they'll get into real shallow water and sip and roll and move for emerging pupa. And a lot of people go, oh, no, those are, those are spinnerizes. Well, they do look kind of like a mayfly spinnerize, but it's just the sheer volume of, of insects in the flow. Um, and in failing light, that while they may look like they're taking uh, mayfly spinners, they're in fact taking emerging pupa because of the, the sheer number of them and the number of deformed pupa that are in the flow. So it tries to demystify um, caddis emergences, and it talks about the major hatches and some very popular and easy to tie uh, fly patterns. Again, the iris caddis and the x caddis that you can successfully uh, fish these emergences and egg laying um, activity. A lot of people miss caddis egg laying activity. You know, they arrive in the, uh, for instance, on the Henry Swark early in the morning and they see these fish sip, gently sipping and they immediately think, God, they're on mayfly spinners. Well, you take your little seine out that you buy at the aquarium store for 75 cents and you put it in the flow and all of a sudden you decide, discover, my God, there's millions of spent caddis, caddis that have uh, laid their eggs and died. And they're a very important food source during their time on the water. So you got to learn to recognize that, which is so simple, just by taking that little seine out and you put on a very easy fly to tie a spent caddis and you're taking fish immediately and big selective fish. What's the, uh, what's the spent uh, caddis pattern imitation that you'd use? Um, I use a simple body. It's got a Zelon, uh, Zelon dubbing body uh, abdomen. It has a spent wing of either parapost or Zelon medium to dark dun, and a little thorax or a head uh, figurated around those wings. And you sweep the wings back on about a 45 degree angle to, to imitate those spent caddis. And then just a thorax or a head of uh, hair's ear. You can tie the fly in 30 seconds and you can, it's so durable and easy to see um, that you can catch a bunch of fish on it. And, you know, while the, while you may catch a fish or two on a mayfly spinner, you'll catch 10 times more fish, particularly larger selective fish. If you're, if you're in the ballpark in terms of pattern. Mm, right. And you mentioned the tan cast. Let's keep going around the hatches, just focusing on caddis. So, um, 
you mentioned the hydropsyche. And, yeah, you, uh, you know, the yeah. hydropsyche really is the second cat. The first caddis, of course, is the of importance is the brachycentris, the Mother's Day caddis. Mm, yeah. And, you know, this area is famous for Mother's Day caddis, whether you're on the lower Madison, you're on the Henry's Fork, or you're on the Yellowstone. The Mother's Day caddis is the first important caddis. And it, and it occurs, obviously, during the time of, of Mother's Day, you know, uh, late April, first part of May, primarily. On the upper Madison, it, it can be really important later uh, during the month of May. Mm -hmm. But that's a hard one to miss because there are so many adults fluttering around. Um, and they fish tend to concentrate primarily initially on the emerging pupa. But that's a caddis that uh, the, the spent caddis can become very important later on in the hatch. You know, a lot of people think because they see a bunch of caddis flying around, um, that they're that they're going to come down in the water. They're going to mate and come down in the water and lay lay their eggs. Well, caddis, unlike mayflies, caddis can live for two weeks because they can accept moisture into their system. So you'll see these big flights of caddis, and consequently, that, what that is is a female caddis looking for male caddis to mate with. And once you see, uh, you know, they're primarily a late day or early morning egg layer, and that's when you look for that rise form. And you do. I like to, to think of it as you do what the river tells you to do. You don't immediately run up to the bank and put on a bobber and start flailing the water with a San Juan worm. What I like to tell people is sit on the bank for five minutes and watch what's going on. It, it just unfolds right in front of you. Get on a likely piece of water, watch the insect activity, watch the rise forms, take out your little seine and spend 30 seconds in the river. Uh, saning, and you're going to determine what the fish are feeding on, put it on an appropriate pattern, and you're going to catch fish. That's awesome. Let's keep going around. What what would be the next one? Is that then the tan cash? What's the next one after that? The, then the hydropsyche, yeah, but mixed in with the hydropsyche uh, is the little black caddis, the Glossosoma montana, which is a little black caddis, which is a sneaky little son of a gun, because sometimes in the population can vary greatly from year to year. You know, you have a year like last year where on the Madison, it was a force. That that caddis was huge in terms of insect activity and rising fish to that insect activity. Whereas on the Firehole River in, in Yellowstone National Park, the little black caddis um, usually is, is much more prevalent and mu a much more um, featured insect in terms of what the fish are feeding on. Last year, it was not that case. So you really have to pay attention to the glossosoma. So, you know, you have, of course, the brachycenter, some Mother's Day. You have the little tan caddis, which is the hydropsyche, and you have the glossosoma. Those are the first three caddises um, that you really have to have to concentrate on. Uh, about mid-season, you know, then, then you'll have cumatopsyche, which is a little tan caddis, uh, much like the hydropsyche, but uh, size 18, where the hydropsyche is a 14, 16. Um, you may have helicopsyche uh, on the on the Firehole River as well as the Henry's Fork, and then you have followed by the Ryacophila. And the Ryacophila is the, kind of the cro magnum of caddis. It, it does not build a case. It's a free form caddis that lives on the bright green larva, which is very important um, to fish and fishermen. Uh, and that comes off later on in, in mid July, mid to late July. Um, that can become very important at that time. And you have a couple other species of caddis that are locally important, whether it be on the Yellowstone River in the park um, or on the Henry's Fork, some smaller caddis. Mysticites um, is another one. You know, we call that the black dancing caddis, which is really important on spring creeks. So, you know, if, if you know your caddis, you know when to expect them, um, you're going to be you're going to be doing very well tying according uh, representative patterns, which are very easy to tie. So what would be, if you went back to like the Mother's Day caddis, what would be a good one that would imitate that? There's three different um, caddis patterns that I'll use for the Mother's Day caddis. One is a pupa. It's an olive. It's, they have distinct olive body and have a very dark, almost black wing. I just use like a, an olive body with a turn or two of starling soft tackle, and that imitates um, the, the, pu the emerging pupa. Uh, for the dry fly, you know, there's a lot of impaired and disabled um, caddis that try to emerge and they get caught in the shuck, 
just by nature of the way they emerge. You know, they get caught as they try to, uh, that little gas bubble that forms inside their exoskeleton as they ascend to the surface and they get trapped in their shuck and they become readily available. And that's where the X caddis works its magic. Just a trailing shuck of caddis dyed xelon, uh, a dub body of olive xelon dubbing and a simple deer hair wing and you're in the game 14s and 16s and that caddis uh you know you can fish that primarily throughout all the uh, insect activity whether it be emerging caddis or egg laying caddis but if you want to really get specific for the egg laying caddis again uh kind of an olive xelon body um a wing of parapost or xelon dark dun kind of swept back at a 45 degree angle and hair's mask thorax. And you're, you're right in the ballpark for the, the spent in the egg laying, uh, brachycentris mother's day caddis. Mother's day. Okay. And then what about like the black caddis and the tank caddis? Is there a dry fly, uh, example? The little black caddis is really interesting in that it's the only pupa that can caddis pupa that can swim hmm. and it can move around and, during the heat of the summer, it may be the only insect that is furnishing dry fly activity and feeding activity because it lives in the highly oxygenated shallow riffle sections of the river. And quite often in the morning, if you get there early in the morning, for instance, on the Madison or the Yellowstone, all the fish, I mean, every one of those fish will be nosed up into those riffle sections, taking emerging glossosoma pupa, and their, the color of them is pink. They're pink, and people don't realize that until they say, and a good friend of ours, Rick Duffield, uh, I kind of lost track of Rick because of COVID, but Rick saned up a bunch of them on the Madison one day, and he said, we got to tie imitations, and we tied imitations, and we just killed them throughout the dog days of summer. And pink. They're pink pupa, yep. When they emerge, they're amber. The moment that they emerge, their body turns to amber, a brilliant amber. So consequently, if you tie a pink larva or a pink pupa, and then you tie an amber bodied with a dark gray or black wings, and they're size 20, they're tiny, but the fish really love them. Um, but if you tie an X caddis with a dark black or gray wing and an amber uh, xelon body and just a shuck of caddis xelon, you're, you're, you're with a killing pattern. You can't go wrong. Mm, okay, so pink and the X cat is probably on a lot of these. You could use it; it overlaps depending on the yes. color. Yeah. Yep. Well, what about the hydro psyche? The the tank has the hydro psyche is really unique in that uh, this is where we came up with the, the fly pattern. The iris caddis. Um, the iris caddis was tied to imitate an emerging pupa caught in its shuck, and the hydro psyche emerges in mass, huge numbers of emerging. Uh, Hydropsyche late in the afternoon, their body just prior to emerging is a brilliant amber, as in the shuck is kind of a neutral caddis, real light tan, and of course they have a tan wing. So consequently, you can tie the iris caddis with that uh, caddis dyed xelon uh, shuck, uh, amber body, and if you use pheasant tail, which I do quite often for the body, just that uh, ambery colored pheasant frilly fibers on a center tail. And then you, you take uh, the wings. And a lot of people think that the wings that we uh, imitate with a loop of xelon, a loop of white or cream colored xelon uh, to imitate the wings. A lot of people think that we were trying to imitate the exoskeleton caught in that shuck. But those are the emerging wings that are trapped in the shuck. And then just a simple head of hair's mask. And again, you can tie one of these in under a minute. You know, the shuck, a dub body, a loop wing of xelon, and a head of, of a hair's mask, spiky head of hair's mask dubbing, floats like a cork in failing light when you dress that fly with a, a desiccant floating. Um, you, you, can, you can see it a mile away. <laughs> yeah, this is awesome. Where did your, the entomology, it sounds like you're very knowledgeable. Is this something you had me, a mentor or you taught yourself? You know, this I, is a lot, a lot of people, the entomology is a struggle, right? Yeah, you know, it, <laughs> I grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And of course, Doug Swisher and Carl Richards, that's where they were. And they, they wrote their first book, uh, Selective Trout, um, right there on the banks of the Rogue River there and the Muskegon River and the Pier Marquette, where I kind of cut my teeth initially. 
on fly fishing. And, and I really paid attention to gentlemen like that. They were members of our local TU group. And that kind of PQ'd my, uh, my uh, inquisitiveness in terms of insects. And I've always been a nut on insects. I used to have a huge butterfly collection and moth collection. I raised monarch butterflies when I was a kid. My folks built me an enormous screened-in porch, and I had several hundred monarch pets, butterflies as pets back then. Anyway, when we moved here, I just uh, just continued that on um, in terms of aquatic insects. And again, you know, you just do what the river tells you to do. And, and it's so simple and so easy if someone... Uh, a beginning angler just spends a little bit of time learning the primary insects, how to fish them, the technique, and some corresponding fly patterns. They're going to catch 10 times more fish than if they mindlessly just put on a couple of nymphs and a bobber and, and flail the water. You know, I, I love to tell the story, and I had this happen again a week ago. I was fishing the Madison. I'm sitting on the bank. It was a day about just above freezing, and there's so much snow this year. I was sitting in my vehicle with my wife watching the water and all of a sudden here comes the noses and you know they're fishing they're feeding on midges because that's really the only insect activity you're going to have in the middle of winter. So I get get down and I sit on my butt and I'm scooching along in my Patagonia waders and walking on my knees. Thank God for those knee pads in the waders. And I get as close as I can to these fish. I love to see their eyes when they take midges. And they get so locked into feeding on emerging midges. Well, I have two anglers on the other side of the river, and they're running up and down the bank with nets that you could net uh, Atlantic salmon with. And they're, they're busting through crotch-deep snow. And I'm watching them leapfrog and running, and they never catch a fish. Jackie, my wife, says, you know, you caught seven fish well, I, in 25 minutes on the tip of your rod fishing 6X and a size uh, 24 midge, while those guys caught absolutely nothing, but they got a lot of nice exercise. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's It's a good reminder that uh, there's something to be said, like, like you said, that uh, sitting back and just observing, right? That's a big part of this. Yep. Just do what the river tells you to do. Yeah. And do you think that's good advice for if somebody wanted to really learn about entomology and start to understand what's going on, just to, they could learn a lot by just doing that and, and understanding the insects, the caddis and everything. I, I think so. You know, they, there's so much information online. Uh, there's so many good little publications and there's so many great, uh, whether they're trout unlimited groups or federation, international federation of fly fishers groups. Um, and they should attend a meeting where they're talking about uh, insects and, and, you know, Again, there's so much out there to learn from, but the river's going to tell you the most. And you can read and you can talk to people, but boy, there's no substitute for time on the water. And I tell people, just sit and watch. And I had a couple that came here from, from Las Vegas, Nevada. They couldn't wait to fish midges. And they come to Yellowstone a couple of years ago and they want to fish the Madison. And I, I give them a couple of flies and I send them down to the river, down by Reynolds Pass Bridge. And I said, you're going to have midges uh, and fish feeding on them at 12, from 12 noon to 2 o'clock. So they go down and they, they, I guess they fish and they come back the next day and they walk in the door and they're kind of dour. And I said, what, what, how'd you do? They said, we never saw a fish. I said, you never saw a fish? I said, and the number one ingredient to successful midge fishing in the winter is calm conditions. If the wind's blowing, you're probably not going to have good dry fly fishing. But I asked them, I said, was it calm? They said, dead calm. Got up to 27 degrees, blah, blah, blah. So just then one of my guides walked in the door and I said, hey, Dan, I said, would you mind taking these people down to the river? And they, you could tell they were looking at each other like this guy's trying to sell us a guide trip. And I said, I'll tell you what. I said, if it works, I said, and you are so inclined, you could buy Dan a beer and maybe a burger afterwards. I said, I'm not going to charge you a dime. So they lit up and they went down there. And I'll never forget, I was talking to the guy later. And he said, classic, he said, we get down to the river and they're standing on the bank. And I'm sitting down on my eye level, basically with the water. And he said, there's five or six fish working in a little pool right in front of us. I turned and I said to Tab, I said, do you see those fish rising? And he looked at his wife and smiled and winked and said, oh, yeah, look at them all. Well, they didn't see the fish rising. Dan says, sit on the goddamn bank. Huh. 
And they sat on the bank, and he said he watched that guy's eyes open up real wide and go, holy smokes, look at the fish rising. Bingo. They finally got it, and they did what the river basically told them to do. Yeah. Wow, that's good advice. Nice. So It's all simple. <laughs> yeah, it is. That's the thing about the fly fishing thing. I love, that's why this conversation is great, because so many people, when they get into fly fishing or before they get into it, they think it's so complicated, right? And it can be, you can make it complicated. But what you're saying is like, literally, it could be as simple as sitting down by the river, observing for a little bit, even if you're brand new to it, right? And you're just going to get, that's probably a good first start. That's what you're saying. Totally, totally. And you know, everybody, everybody blames fly pattern. 90% of it is not fly pattern. It's, it's drag. You know, people don't defeat drag. Um, they just don't fish the fish. They try to make these ungodly long casts and consequently they can't keep track of their 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 fly and they can't defeat drag they don't even detect the hit i tell them get close put on the right fly pattern the right tippet defeat drag pinpoint accurate cast and you're going to catch so many fish and lo and behold people 90 percent of them get it after a sh very short time today's episode is sponsored by country financial the fires in the Northwest and throughout the West in, in the last few years have been devastating for thousands of people. Uh, those folks, some folks have lost their homes, their belongings, uh, and their sense of safety has all been challenged. This is why insurance and protecting your assets are so critical. Dalton at Country Financial is here, and he was on the front lines during the fires, handing out checks to Country Financial community members, providing drinks, food, and more. And each time Dalton meets up with a client, he does an extensive review of their current assets and coverage. This is his opportunity to really decide and let you know what you need uh, to make educated decisions for your insurance needs. This is a super critical piece. And Dalton Roy, Roy loves it. He loves getting out in the rural community, connecting with people, loves the outdoors, fishing, hunting, everything that goes with it. And so I'm excited to be sharing uh, Country Financial and Dalton with you. The unexpected will happen, so it's always best to make sure your assets and life are protected. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash country right now to get started. That's C-O-U-N-T-R-Y. Check out Dalton and support this podcast and a great local company right now. The pheasant tails, we talked about that earlier. Is there a pheasant tail uh, dry that would imitate some of these caddis we've been talking about? Oh, God. Well, what I do is I just simply substitute pheasant tail for the body rather than dubbing. Oh, okay. So you just use pheasant tail. Yeah. And whether it's a midge, sometimes like on our Zelon midge, I'll tie one or two little pheasant tail fibers, wrap that forward for the abdomen, figure eight my thread through it for durability, and then tie a wing on and figure eight dubbing around the wing. Um, and you're fishing. Boom. You can tie it in 30 seconds. Mm. Do you dye those like to get different colors for the body? Well, you know, take a look at a pheasant tail and you've got black, you've got amber, you've got brown, you've got brownish olive, all natural color. It's all there. Yeah. I, I used to dye them. I had more, more goddamn colors of pheasant tails, but here in the last five or 10 years, I go, I don't need to dye them. You know, they're, they're taking natural pheasant tail. Gotcha. Yeah, another pattern. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of uh, Jim Teeney. He's kind of a oh, Northwest. God, yeah. Sure, yeah, you know Jim. Sure. Well, he's a good example of, uh, you know, the pheasant tail, right? The teeny nymph was a fly that he sure. literally has caught, you know, so many yeah. species on it. And it, all it is is a couple of wraps of, I mean, he used it for more salmon and bigger stuff, but right? I mean, same idea. It's just pheasant tail. Same idea. Yep. You know, and I always like to say uh, originality in fly tying is just undetected plagiarism. <laughs> it's It's been done before. Yeah. That's right. The, the cl classic example, we're, we're reading about shucks, you know, uh, like Gary LaFontaine's shucks on, on his caddis and right on down the line. And we think, man, in our sparkle done in our ex caddis and our Evers caddis and all that. I wrote an article one time about shucks for Fly Rod and Reel magazine. And we think we're really onto something. And of course, Swisher and Richards, they use duck wheel sections for shucks. Hmm. But I, I, a friend of mine, Herb Wellington, who owns Spring Creek, where Nick Lyons wrote his book, gave me a book years ago by Colonel E.W. Harding, published in 1937. And it, a big discussion 
on sparkly, shimmering shucks. It's been done before, guys. <laughs> yeah, right. It's not new. And yeah. Gary LaFontaine, you, you, we've been talking about Caddis, but I mean, what's his book? He actually had one of the big books on Caddis, right? The, the best book. The best book ever written on Caddis. And I tell people when they, when they become serious, um, you have to read Gary's book. That, that's the best book ever written on Caddis Flies. Right. And what's the name of the book? Caddis Flies. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. So tell me, did you know Gary? Oh, yeah, I knew Gary. Yeah. We've heard some stories about Gary. I ne we never talked to him. I didn't know him. But I mean, there's so many stories. What would be one way you would sum up Gary? Because he seems like he was such a powerhouse, but unique. Yeah, you know, the energy and excitement. If he couldn't get you fired up to go fishing, you didn't belong to have a fly rod in your hand. Him and his dog, you know, and uh, I spent a lot of time with Gary. Gary and I did the first River Rap series, little video or little uh, audios on fishing. And, uh, you know, just the excitement that he had. He would walk in a fly shop, much like old Charlie Brooks, you know, the local West Yellowstone author. And he'd light the place up. You know, he'd just walk in and the whole place would get electric. And everybody would start talking about fly patterns and fishing and caddis flies and mayflies. And pretty soon, you know, everybody had a cup of coffee and the place was just, just buzzing with activity. Guys were tight. You know, that was one thing. We had six or eight vices around the shop and we'd all be tying flies and excitedly talking about patterns. And that, that's fly fishing, you know, just innovation and, and the fun and the people that you meet and swapping stories. That's what it's all about. Yeah, it is. And that was Gary. And that was Gary. Yeah, yep. that's just so cool. I love that. Um, your fly shop, what, I mean, and I, I grew up around a little tiny fly shop, so I know a little bit of that experience, but yours seems like it was such a larger uh, process and shop. What, what is that? What, what did you love most about just coming into the fly shop? And was that a regular thing you'd spend your time in the shop? I would come in the shop seven days a week and I loved, loved to get in the shop about seven o'clock in the morning and people would be waiting to talk to you. And we just start swapping stories and flies pretty soon. I mean, it seemed like one cup of coffee later, it was 12 noon. And then another cup of coffee was time to go home and, you know, when we lived in, in West Yellowstone, and I was the police chief, um, as well as the owner of Blue Ribbon Flies, we had more goddamn fun because, again, that place was open 24-7. And there were times when my wife would push me out the door and go, you got to go home and get two hours of sleep, man. You're running on empty. I, I couldn't get enough of it. And you met, you met so many, some from President Carter to President Ford, right on down the line. You know, you met the greatest people. Um, Tom Brokaw, Dan Rather, all those news guys. Uh, Verlin Klinkenberg from the New York Times. You know, you met all those guys. And everybody, it was a common language, was fly fishing and fly tying. And it was so much fun. Yeah, that's it. So you, and you would be there pretty much all night almost, like until the late and then get up early and show up again in the morning. Oh, God, I don't know if you, you ever heard the name Jack Gartside. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Gartside. The Gartside Gurgler. Yeah, Gartside Gurgler. Jack Gartside had a room in our basement at Blue Ribbon Flies. He told people he slept in a tent up in Duck Creek, the grizzly bear section of Yellowstone Park. But Jack really slept in the basement of Blue Ribbon Flies. And he, he and I tied together for many, many years. And we would sit there 24 hours a day. And back then I smoked like a chimney and Jack, of course, always smoked like a chimney. And we sit there and smoke cigarettes and tie flies all day for 24 hours. Go, 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 go. And, uh, you know, Jack was such a good friend and he was such an innovator. And he was a lot like Gary, you know, Gary LaFontaine, just the energy he had. But I always like to tell the story. Jack had an appetite like no, no other. And he was a skinny looking guy, skinny and tall. And he always looked like he was just going to waste away. And I used to love it because I've seen him go out to dinner three and four times a night by, he, he could look just, he looked just famished. People fly, fly fishermen would come in the door and he'd go watch this. And he'd put that forlorn look on his face and the guy'd walk up and go, Jack, how are you? And he'd go, oh, I'm just famished. Well, hell, come on out to dinner with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was a god. master of that. Oh, God, he was more fun. I gave our first first Yellowstone VW orange and white van to Jack Gartside. My wife and I gave it to him because he'd always show up. He'd take a bus out to Yellowstone. 
and he didn't have a vehicle, he'd hitchhike. So we gave him our old beat up van. And the first thing he did is take a rag doll and tie a noose around its neck and hang it in the back window because he loved people to stop and talk with him. And that <laughs> sure was a that sure was a stopper. <laughs> oh wow. That's so cool. So you're talking about 1979, 80, 81, starting the fly shop. I mean, back then to now, I mean, how have things changed? What, what is the biggest thing you, when you see it must be? I mean, obviously more people, but um, do you see like, well, the, yeah. The, the biggest change, of course, not only the number of anglers, but um, the advances made, you know, whether it be waders, fly lines, leaders, tippets, fly patterns, the whole nine yards. I mean, the advances made in fly fishing uh have been have been incredible i always say fish don't have a chance anymore but thank god for that little pea brain and selectivity they sure do but that and of course locally the changes you know when we came to west yellowstone the town was run by by organized crime my wife and i thought oh really we were, yeah we thought it was going to be like andy a mayberry she was going to be aunt b and i was going to be andy and all we were going to do is was fish and tie flies and the town was totally wide open. And I'm writing a book right now about those police chief years. My my good friend, uh, you're probably too young to remember Tom Brokaw. but Oh, no, I know Tom, yeah. Yeah, Tom was with NBC Nightly News for so many years. And he made me promise him a few years back I was going to write this book. And I'm closing in on 85,000 words. i got a ways to go. But it's all about the adventures of West Yellowstone. And again, not only not only organized crime, but we had ladies of the evening we had motorcycle gangs from the Gypsy Jokers to Hell's Angels, and we had four cops that that police that town 24/7. And we made it work because I always had a motto: "You police a town the way it wants to be policed." And we did, and we made it work, and nobody got hurt. And we became friends with not only the bikers, um, but the ladies of the evening. We all got along together, and those were the greatest times of my life. That's when we started Blue Ribbon Flies. And we'd ha we'd have the hookers hanging around the fly shop smoking cigarettes. Wow. We'd have the bikers coming in buying skunk tails to hang off their motorcycles. And we all became big buddies. And everybody said, you can't get along with the Hells Angels. Well, we did. And uh, the worst bikers were the Gypsy Jokers. Those guys were mean son of a guns out of Oregon. But we all got along. And I love to tell the story, you know, two years ago, I had a guy, the meanest man I ever met in my life the meanest son of a gun. He was just a nasty big biker. He was probably six foot four, weighed 235 pounds. But I got along with him 40 years ago, okay? Well, a couple of years ago, I'm in the shop and I'm messing around, getting stuff together. And this guy walks through the front door and I go, I know this guy. And he's all hunched over, greasy, long ponytail. And I go, that's freaking tiny, the gypsy joker that I had such issues with. And he shuffles to the to the desk and he looks at me and he goes, you don't remember me. And I said, yes, I do. Later that day, he and I went out and fished Tenkara together. He he became a big Tenkara fisherman. That's that's what fly fishing does. It brings people together. And it was it's it was so much fun. And it still is. <laughs> no, that's cool. I mean, I think that says a lot about you, I think, especially in these this day and age. Right. You know, you hear a lot about the the negative side of all the you know, politics and just everything. Yeah. But I mean, what, what we lose is that what you're talking about. I mean, literally you were the police chief. And instead of being like, I'm just going to like lock up everybody, you're like, you know what, let's have a conversation and see if yeah. we can talk. You know, when you look at that, does it seem uh, to, to some that might seem impossible, but what was the secret to that? Was it literally that easy just sitting there and actually talking to him? It was, you know, the, the big secret was I would pull up. I'll never forget one time I pulled up to the Hells Angels and we had a uh, all points bulletin be on the lookout for one of the members of the Hells Angels, who was later picked up in Yellowstone Park, but I pulled over six of them. Um, and fortunately for me, the wanted one had already got through the park gate, so I missed him. But I'm talking to these people, and uh, you know how it is when a when a, a cop, and I was a big guy back then. I was six foot one. I weighed 235 pounds. And I pull these guys, I pull up to these guys, and it's like, oh, here we go. You can tell they're just on the fight. And I said, hey, can I buy you guys a cup of coffee? And they said, are you nuts? And I said, no, I'm not nuts. I said, come on. So we went over to the Silver Spur restaurant. We sat and had coffee. Pretty soon there were 16 of them. We became instant friends. I arranged for a campground for, for the bikers to stay at eight miles out of town 
where they wouldn't. I told them, I said, you won't be bothered by the tourists. And they, I'll never forget, they, they told me, they said, you don't understand. We want to bother the tourists. That's what we do. I said, you know, I know you do that. I said, I'll tell you what. I said, we'll get along great. You can shoot your, your guns out here. You can do whatever you do. Um, and I know you're going to come into town and harass the tourists a little bit. And that's fine, too. But I said, as long as nobody gets hurt, um, we're going to be just fine. Later on that day, I'll never forget, I pull in front of Blue Ribbon Flies, which had just started. And here are two of the bikers with their big ladies. And, of course, they call them their old ladies. And here they are on the back of their bike. And I'll never forget, there's a guy and his two sons from Kansas City, Missouri. And his two sons are like 10 and 11. And they're going to walk into Blue Ribbon Flies. And here's the two bikers with their two ladies. And the ladies are comparing tattoos on their shoulders. Well, pretty soon, both ladies rip off their shirts. And, and I go, <laughs> oh, my God. And these are big, these are big 200-pound women. Wow. And these little kids turn to their dad and go, this is such a great town, Dad. I'll, I'll, <laughs> never, I'll never forget it. And I had to go over and say to the bikers, hey, hey guys, can, can you knock that off? You know, and they just, they just laughed. And we never had a problem that way again. But uh, I, I just wrote about that the other day in the book. It, was, it always stuck with me. Crazy. Do you have a title for the book? Oh, God, I've got 50,000 titles, and I haven't settled on one yet. Right, right. God, this is this is amazing. So this is going to be exciting to hear about this book. Um, and the Gypsy Jokers, I mean, I didn't even know. Obviously, the Hells Angels is a very known name, but the Gypsy Jokers was a similar thing to the Hells Angels, just a biker gang. Oh, yeah. And the Sons of Silence. The Sons of Silence was a, a bike gang that a lot of people thought were, were even worse, but they were the cleanest bike gang I ever worked with. You could give them the campground, and they would pick up every dog on pull tab off a beer can. Back then, they had pull tabs. The campground was actually neater when they left than when they came there. And most bikers were, were that way. They were very proud of the fact that they had their own little turf, their own little fire pits. We brought in an outside toilet for them, which they used, and they kept it so clean. And I was always really proud of that because, you know, everybody here was, was talking about how we had to be a bunch of, excuse me, but we had to be a bunch of rough asses. And I said, no, we don't. We can get along with these people just by treating them the same way. You know, we all put our underwear on the same way. And we're going to get along with these guys. And we did. And it was the same way with, the, I'll, I'll give you a short story with the ladies of the evening. I find out that, and it was fairly obvious uh, what was going on the first night. We uh, attended a little local function at one of the nightclubs in town. And it was a, a strip joint, but that night it wasn't a strip joint. It was more for the Chamber of Commerce. Anyway, here we are, and I see these gals walking around, and they didn't look like, you know, I mean, they, they were dressed for their profession, let's put it that way. You know, seams, nylon stockings and lipstick and, and all dolled up. And uh, one of them walked up to me, and, they, and we started flirting a little bit back and forth, and my wife was on the dance floor dancing with her, her buddy and uh, uh, a couple of cowboys, and she kept staring back, and I watched her fingernails grow as she's seen me talk to this lady. Anyway, I figure out what's going on, and I said, gals, and there were six of them. And I said, ladies, I want you in my office tomorrow morning. We're going to have a discussion. Long story short, um, I told them that they were free to go. They were free to ply their trade as long as nobody got rolled. They didn't steal money from one of their customers. They were clean, no disease, and every... Friday, I wanted them in my office. I'd buy them lunch. We'd drink Coca-Cola and, and smoke cigarettes, and they were going to tell me what was going on around town, and it worked for many years. Uh, prostitutes are very smart. They're very cagey, but they're great people, and still three of them live in West Yellowstone, and I see them from time to time, and we kind of walk down memory lane. They all got married, successful business people, you know, right on down the line. But back then, that's what they did. And we got along with them and they got along with us. And we all worked together. Wow, that is uh, that's an amazing story. I mean, I wasn't even thinking about going down this track. But for you, it feels like it's this has been a pretty full life. How do you feel when you look back at this? You've had some pretty amazing stories. I tell people I'm the luckiest guy in the world. You know, I've, I've got to live 74 years now of the greatest life. Um, and I've been and a lot of it's been luck. You know, don't get me wrong. God dang, I've, I've, 
dodge some amazing <laughs> things. But, uh, you know, it's just the people that we've met, the things we've done. I've had an amazing life. And uh, I hope to get a couple more years out of it. Yeah, definitely. Well, what do you, as you look ahead, what, what keeps you excited now as you look out, say, you know, over the next, you know, 10 years or whatever? It sounds like conservation is still a big piece. Anything else that's kind of getting you fired up? Yeah, it, the conservation part of it's, you know, recently we founded and co-founded Fly Fishing Climate Alliance. And let's face it, that's that's going to be the biggest challenge of our life is saving this planet and, and uh, doing a battle with climate change. Um, and that's where we're concentrated right now. I recently did a thing, Montana State University's climate conference um, to teach advocacy and activism. And what really puts a smile on my face is to see the number of young people that are getting involved because it's not going to be our government or our religious leaders. It's going to be our young people and our business that's going to save businesses that are going to save um, this this world, this planet. But but that ex that excites me. You know what what's what's taking place there, and uh, just the fact that you know last year I fished uh, 190 some days. This year, the month of January, I think I I was out 18 days. So I get to, I still get to spend a lot of time fishing. I love to train bird dogs. I've got a couple of German short hairs. We spend a lot of time in the field and I love to elk hunt. I've shot 44 mature bulls in 44 years on public land. And I've wore out four Nordic incline machines doing that. So I stay in shape and I get excited to face every day and be a part of the solution. That's it. What's your activity? So it sounds like, yeah, staying in shape. How have you done that over the years? Give us the, the inside. I've tried to get the secrets to your, you know, your health and success. What do you, have you been doing that for a while? Today I'll be on that God, and I hate that Nordic track, but <laughs> I've been on, on a Nordic track for, geez, 30 years. And, uh, you know, I use it religiously every other day. We cross country ski here. I can ski. I wish you could see right out the house. We've got a little herd of mule deer that feed around our house. We've got a big herd of elk that winter here. We've got a lot of snow, so we can uh, cross-country ski, um, as well as utilize the incline machine. And I've got a Bowflex uh, weight machine, so I work on weights. And again, I fish a lot. I hike a lot. And I don't consciously try to stay in shape, but I stay in shape just because I love to be active. And, uh, you know, and I love to stay active mentally in terms of all these projects that we're working on. You know, I love these guys that I feel sorry for them. They, they retire and two days later they die because they just sit back and they don't do anything. Yeah. And I look at some of these young people that come in and they're, they're 100 pounds overweight and they tell me they can't do uh, what I do. And cripe sakes, they're, they're 60 years younger than I am. Right. So, you know, it, just by being active and, and taking up a hobby that requires uh, hiking or fishing, and wading. I love to wade, um, although I fish most of the time on my knees or on my butt because I like to get close to fish. But I still like to, you know, to be a part of the whole the whole scene here. And in order to do that, you've got to be able to hike and and whether it's hunting or fishing, you're just active all the time. Yeah, that is the key, just being active mentally, physically, and, and you've done that. That's amazing. Um, I've got a lot here. I think we're going to leave on the table just because you know I think maybe maybe we'll have to check back with you at a later point. Um, you know, it's interesting, the conservation stuff, we started there at the start, and I kind of maybe want to take us out there. Um, you know, you're in Montana, there's a lot of Western states, right? You're right in the middle of it. Do you see, um, you know, kind of, do you think of this as like everybody working together as, you know, the Montanas, Wyomings, Idaho, everybody, or is it more of a focus of local groups in each area? How do you see that? Like, what would be your advice to somebody that wanted to do something in their area, maybe they're in a part of the, the country, what would they do? When you look at what's changed things environmentally and from a wildlife standpoint, an outdoor standpoint and a wild trout standpoint, it all begins at the bottom, like a revolution. It begins at the bottom. And this is why grassroots advocacy and activism is so important, particularly now, because we're seeing assaults um, here locally on our, our public lands. You know, you're seeing groups and you're seeing politicians that uh, are threatening to take away and sell public lands um, to do away with protections, water protections, uh, clean water and clean air protections. We're involved right now in uh, proceedings against uh, Yellowstone Club and, and Big Sky 
for water pollution in terms of the Gallatin River. And you've got to get involved. You know, the Gallatin River um, is the life thread um, of that valley, the Gallatin Valley in Bozeman. And you look at what's happening to the Gallatin River, that algae bloom every year. So you stand up and, and you get involved. You know, and I think that's one thing that anglers, fly fishermen, have got to become more and more involved in local issues. And locally, we can make a difference uh, nationally. And, uh, you know, Montana Trout Unlimited is, is so involved. They don't take uh, money from, from uh, dark money, if you will. Um, and they try to stay out of that. And they, they try to, to advocate. And right now, we've got to... Uh, you know, we got to become involved more and more in, in getting data, scientific data. I've been working a little bit with Huey Lewis on data collection. That's right. Yeah, he's a fisherman too, right? That's right. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's all about the the data. And, and a lot of times you get uh, state and, and uh, federal groups that say, well, we don't have any data. Well, then, God dang, we've got to collect that data. And we've got to, we've got to work locally and nationally to protect and preserve what we have left and you have to speak up you got to tell your story and i know a lot of people are very reluctant to become involved you say advocacy and they run and hide but that's what it's all about it's advocacy and activism for the things that we love and if we're talking fly fishing right now we're seeing some real threats on our on our clean water act and, and things like that whether it's clean water clean air and wild trout habitat and native trout habitat we have got to become more involved and it's not just a $10 membership a year. It's you attend meetings, um, write letters, get involved at these meetings with politicians and go face to face with them, you know, call them out. And, and that's where it's at right now. And I think that, uh, just starting there at the local level, right? Find your local group wherever you are in the country, the world. And and if there isn't one, start one, right? Maybe that's a good start. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I love to walk in, have people walk in to a, a local meeting and you can see they have a little trepidation. It's like, uh-oh, are these guys going to accept me? And man, at the end of the meeting, they're, they're one of that group, you know, because we're all in this boat together if we love wild and, and native uh, trout. So that that's where it's out. Get involved locally. Yeah, take us out here. I want I want to leave this off. Um, you know, with uh, kind of Patagonia here and Yvonne. I mean, when you look at all the people you've interacted with, him. You talked about the Hell's Angels. Is there something that you kind of learned from him that you take away? It seems like he's kind of out in front, or he has been. But it seems <laughs> like you you are as well. What, what's the biggest thing? You know, as a friend, you're a friend to him, right? So for those that never met the guy before. What is the secret with him? You, you know, the secret is to be be part of the real deal. And I, and I love to, you know, you talk about non-techie. He, Yvonne and I are the most non-techie. When you talk about podcasts, I'm sitting here talking to this this screen, and I, I'm wondering, how the hell does this really happen? Uh, businesses. Good businesses is how it happens. Well, and, and Yvonne and I, neither one of us, up until a year or so ago, you Either one of us owned a cell phone, okay? And I'll leave you with this story. We're driving along. Either one of us owned a cell phone. We're driving along to go fishing. And he says something. And anyway, I'm driving and I look over at him. And God, he looked really weird. And I pulled over. I said, are you okay? He said, I think I'm having a stroke. You know, Yvonne's mid-80s, but he's in great shape. So I pull over and I open his door and I said, tell me, what, what's the symptoms? What's the deal? He said, my whole right side is numb and it's it's vibrating it's trembling i said holy <sighs> so he gets <laughs> out and i reach into the his pocket of his fishing pants and i pull this goofy device out that's oh and i he goes what the hell is that i said it's a cell phone he said what are we gonna do i said i don't know so we threw it in the back of the truck and we went fishing really <laughs> Oh, wow. And neither one of us knew what a cell phone was or how to answer it. That is amazing. But yet he's the, he's the real deal, you know, and he and I both together really enjoy standing up and talking to young people about advocacy and activism because that's where it's at. And the young people are going to change this world and save the planet. That's amazing. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I think that, uh, I think I'm hopeful to get to Yvonne on the podcast as well because we have a big focus on conservation and, and helping to get the word out. And so, um, sure. So yeah, maybe the maybe the summer what we should do is do one together when he's here in this room, 
and we could do one uh, a quick. He'll, he can't sit still for a half an hour, but we could do a quick one here. There you go. That sounds great. Yeah, we always talk about Patagonia and the great stuff, and you know, in the business of saving our home planet, right? I mean, it's this, it's this really cool yep. story. So, yep. all right, Craig. Well, I'll let you get out here. I appreciate all your time today. We'll send everybody out to Craig Matthews Yellowstone Conservation dot com, and I uh, just want to thank you here, you know, for all the all the good stuff you've been doing over the years for conservation and fly fishing, and I appreciate spending some time with you today. And likewise, thank you, Dave, and I look forward to seeing you sometime soon. There it is, wetflyswing.com slash 427. 427. 427 is where you need to go if you want to enter this still water, uh, get a chance for one of these trips. We'll have a link in there that you can uh, join and get some more information on the upcoming trip. Uh, like we said at the start, we just wrapped this one up. We're giving away uh, that trip soon. If you just want to book a slot right now, you can go over to wetflyswing.com slash trips. Quick listener shout out before we head out of here today. Craig Jost. Shout out to Craig Jost. Uh, Craig reached out to uh, me on email and he said, he said the podcast is awesome. He loves all we're doing uh, and helping him learn about fly fishing. Craig is coming from Colorado, but not the trout part. He says that he lives in the plains and fishes for the warm water species. And he dreams of catching salmon on a fly. I'd love to see more walleye content on the podcast. Awesome, Craig. Well, we are going to deliver that. Some more walleye content is coming your way. I'm going to be working on that for you soon. If you want to grab a shout-out on this episode or if you want to get an episode uh, put together for you, you can reach out to me, Dave, at wetflyswing.com anytime or on social media, wetflyswing, and I will put it together for you. If you haven't checked in or if it's been a while, we would love to hear from you right now. That would be amazing. Okay, uh, quick one before we get out of here. Let's see where we are headed, where we are headed next. All right, all right. We got some good stuff. I'm just looking ahead. Uh, We've got a bunch of episodes. I'm going to highlight a couple. Uh, Thursday, we've got uh, Snake River Fly. This is an awesome episode of Traveled. We're going to dig into one of the places a little bit lower down on the snake that you probably maybe not uh, are aware of. And another tailwater. This thing is amazing. Next week, we've got Tim Flagler. Uh, An amazing episode. Tim Flagler is back. And uh, he's going to talk, of course. uh, He's going to mix it up. Tim's going to be awesome. And then that same week, Brendan Morrison. If you don't know Brendan, he is a national hockey player. He was uh, played for the Vancouver Canucks. We're going to hear his story and how he created uh, one of the fishing shows out there, Real West Coast right now. So check it in. Check it out next week. Click that subscribe button if you're listening right now on your app. If you're an Apple podcast, uh, click that button, that plus sign. Subscribe to us. If you're on Spotify, follow us. And uh, it's the best chance that you will get notified when that next episode goes live. All right. I'm going to get out of here because it is super, super duper late in the night. I hope that I can connect with you on the water. Uh, Maybe this trip up to the Stillwater Lodge, up to the big Northern, Northern Lights Lodge. I hope I get a chance to connect with you on the water there. If not, check in with me online. And I hope you are having a great evening, a great morning, or a great afternoon, wherever in the world you are. And I appreciate you for checking in today. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.